back, AP. Welcome back to it. Welcome back to your flip classroom and our continuing discussion of Unit 3. All right, so yeah, we are all really close to the end of Unit 3 as we journey through this idea of absolutism and constitutionalism together, even though, ironically enough, we still haven't even talked about absolutism whatsoever due to the fact that the College Board is a heinous evil that should be burned to the ground. Yeah, right. So going into it, though, we left off in class talking about the Dutch Golden Age, right? Which is a very important theme, ironically enough, because literally it's one of the most, like, the largest scale things you can talk about to associate economics and economic gain with the growth of intelligence in any kind of empire in particular. And yet again, it's one of those things where the College Board only thought to include one standard on it. not that upset about it, all right? But going into it, though, you have to understand we are now moving into another concept, right? We are moving into a different concept where we are going to begin to discuss how all of these different groups and all of these different cultures and all of these different language barrier entities, these countries, these kingdoms, these things, kind of begin to interact with one another on a large-scale historic moment, right? Because the 1600s is seeing such incremental growth of government and power and militaries and things like that that it's leading to all-out brawls, wars, diplomacy, and a lot of other stuff, right? But speaking of wars, real quick, if you look at wars in general, if you look at, like, conflict in general, from 1517 to 1648, which is the second back end of time period number one in AP European history, what is the primary cause of war? When we look at 1517 to 1648, the biggest cause of war is that of religion, right? Because in 1517, you're going to see the Reformation begin underneath Martin Luther. In 1648, that's going to be the culmination of the three years war, right? So from that giant chunk of time, right, that 130 years right there, the biggest driver behind conflict was religion, right? Now, after this period, though, we will see power and influence being the larger driver behind conflict. Due to the fact that after the 30 years war, you will kind of see the summation of religious conflict and religious warfare in general, all right? So now what we're going to be discussing, though, is this thing known as the balance of power, right? Because there's an intrinsically different thing when studying American history to European history, and that big difference is the fact that, one, America, yes, is geographically much larger and things like that than that of Europe, but the bigger thing that we need to understand is that America dominates land-wise and also geopolitically-wise for a large chunk of its history. A lot of the military conflicts and a lot of the military scale and a lot of the like larger economic output of all of North America, right? Whereas in Europe, you've got a lot of major players involved here, right? You've got tons of different communities, tons of different like kingdoms, tons of different uh, countries that are rising up, nation-states at this time, that do or don't like each other, right? You've got France and England who have been in a bitter rivalry since the 1300s, right? Or actually, you could even argue before that, right? Going all the way back to the 10 hundreds when you're talking about 1066, the Battle of Hastings and William Normandy and the Enormous and Conquest of England. Now, it's like, now, look, you could argue that that is a really, really big deal, the rivalry between those two places, right? And also, if we like fast forward and look at like World War II, you're going to still see that fi that rival rivalry finally kind of come to a close when they had to unite against a common enemy. Actually, that would be World War I when they really did that in the first place. But the thing that we need to understand, though, is France and England are just one image or one, two, like, pair of people that had issues with each other at one point in time, right? You also can look as well at France and Germany later on. You can look as well at areas of Scandinavia and Russia. You can look at all these different parts and places in Europe, and you got to understand we've got a lot of different players at this party. We've got a lot of different people in this game, right? So the balance of power is going to be very, very important when you're talking about the growth of European history, right? Because states are going to begin to lash out at one another to try and keep that power balanced out in Europe, which is going to lead to army sizes tripling during this time period as rulers moved from feudal militaries to professional militaries, which is something that we talked about at the very beginning of this unit, right? When that power vacuum was created during or following the Reformation period, when the power of the church and the power of nobles began to fail and monarchs began to move up into that space, absolutists are going to exert a lot of that power in that power vacuum 
time by establishing professional militaries, right? Because feudal militaries are weak and awful, all right? But another big thing that's going to happen as well to keep that power balanced out, because you don't want France having way more power than Britain or having way more power than other people, because it's going to throw off the balance of power and you're going to lead yourself into really, really dicey wars like we talked about in class, right? Like when the Nazis and fascist regimes came to power in the 1930s and 40s and led to an all-out war that, like, that literally encompassed the entire continent, right? So really, really quickly, though, you want to keep that power balanced out. And it always didn't result in war, right? War wasn't the only way to keep these scales non-tipped, right? Diplomacy is going to be a major tactic that's used during this time, right? And what diplomacy is in general is just coming to agreements via, via negotiations, right? Discussing with one another how you're actually going to make sure wars don't break out, all right? Or you don't lead yourself into an economic downturn and how you're going to make sure that you actually understand each other and keep that power balanced out, right? For example, you could argue that whenever Elizabeth actually made an ally or an al alliance with the Dutch, that was a part of her keeping power balanced out against a very strong Spanish empire at the time, right? So diplomacy is going to be huge. And the biggest reason why diplomacy is going to play out in this way is because dynastic powers are the biggest driver behind the balance of power at this point. It's a driver a lot in this flip. I'm going to go to something else. The biggest reason why the balance of power is kind of being shifted back and forth a little bit, but eventually always comes back to neutrality, is because dynastic powers are at major play here. And what we mean by dynastic powers is large-scale families that are trying to keep this power as balanced as they possibly can to make sure that their heirs continue to rule and to make sure that their heirs can do that with a lot of land and a lot of finances, right? And these right here are some of the biggest dynastic powers in Europe at the time. You're looking at people like the Stuarts or the Romanovs or the Bourbons or the Hohenzollerns. Now, the Stuarts, of course, being right here, who are now the currently the kings and queens of England by this point in history in the 1600s, starting in 1603 with the creation of the Stuart monarchy in England underneath James I and VI. We've got the Romanovs over here, which some of you may have heard of before, that have been in power since the actual... Mm, uh, 1618, I believe, is when they came into power. Yes. Um, now, like, so the Romanovs under Mikhail Romanov that come in after Rurikids, kids, some of y'all may know them as being the very, 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 very... 20 minutes later. Very, very, very famous family from Russia, right? You've also got the Bourbons right here, who are now in power in all of France. And then, of course, last but not least, you got this crew right here, the Hohenzollerns. So the Hohenzollerns are actually the leaders of Prussia, who will later on become the biggest and first leaders of Germany when it actually creates itself in, 18, um, in 1871, right? So the Hohenzollerns, though, are very important, and they're kind of in the background, and we won't talk about them much at all in this unit, but the Prussians are important, right? Those those pesky Prussians. Now, like going into it, though, we have to understand our next thing, though, is but what do you do if you don't have a strong family or leadership at the helm? This kind of demonstrates to us that the balance of power was being negotiated or the situation that we're about to talk about demonstrates to us that this was being negotiated by these families, right? Because if you have a small army and a small share of power because you don't have a really strong monarchy during the 1600s at the time, the balance of power tends to gobble you up. And I mean that quite literally, right? So that literally the strongest countries in all of Europe at this time were being led by famous families, right? Whether you got the Habsburgs in Austria, who is somebody else that could have gone on that list, right? Whether you also have the Habsburgs that were in Spain that are going to come to a climactic close pretty soon, and a cadet branch of the Bourbons is actually going to pop up in Spain, right? So if you don't have those, you tend to kind of disappear and go away. And what ends up happening is diplomacy is the reason why. Because those other big families will agree with each other about your demise, right? So what ended up happening is a good example of this is looking all the way into the future, which again, I don't know why the college board wants to talk about the partitioning of Poland in the 17, late 1700s when we're only in the 1600s. Exactly. So the thing that we need to understand though in general is we're gonna look at an example of balance of power and stuff like that in history in general, right? So we are fast forwarding over 100 years, right? We are fast forwarding over 150 years, actually, to talking about kind of the leftover, the leftover causes of absolutism in Europe, right? And what's gonna end up happening is poor, poor, poor little Poland is going to cease 
to exist. All right, it's like now literally because of diplomacy and these strong families, right? Because the thing about it is Poland was extremely weak at the time. In the 1700s, that the Polish monarchy and the constitutional monarchy that they created had left them very, very weak because they had feuding nobility who actually had more power than their monarch. Their economy was very weak and their constitutional monarchy gave a little bit too much power to other people leading to rivalries within their government, right? Now, they also, though, at the time, were surrounded by strong absolutist states, right? That being of Prussia, Russia, and Austria. Now, some of you are like, Mr. Terry, is that a misspelling? Why do you have Russia on there twice and one starts with a P? No, Prussia is a completely different place, right? The Prussians are what you would call baby Germany, right? Because you can actually see it right here. This is East Prussia right there, right? And then Austria is right there, and then the rest of Prussia is over here. Now, speaking of, this is the leader of Prussia at the time. That was a guy his name, Frederick the Great. We'll talk about him a little bit later on when we get to Enlightened Monarchs. You also have Catherine the Great. We'll talk about her a little bit later on when we talk about Enlightened Monarchs. And then you also have Joseph II, who is actually the Austrian leader. And we'll talk about him a little bit later on when we talk about Enlightened Monarchs. Now, going into it, though, you have to understand that Russia was expanding into the Ottoman Empire. Now, some of you are like, I thought we were talking about Poland. Shut up. So, no, let me finish, all right? So the reason why Poland disappeared off the map of Europe is due to the fact that Russia, underneath the leadership of Catherine the Great, was having major military victories on a dwindling Ottoman Empire, right? And we're going to talk about the Ottoman Empire here again here in a few minutes, okay? So the thing that we need to understand, though, is that Europeans got a little freaked out by this, right? Because they don't like the fact that the nearby neighbor of Russia is turning into an empire and they're getting really, really strong. So Prussia and Austria want them to stop, right? Like, they want them to stop expanding into the Ottoman Empire, which be modern day Middle East areas like Turkey, all right, and also some of Western Europe. And they actually want them to stop expanding there. And they were like, look, we'd rather give you a little bit extra land in Europe than see you expand into this other place and get too strong and powerful, tipping that balance of power, right? So they made a deal with them. Prussia and Austria brought them to a table and said, how about this? How about we'll all take little pieces of Poland, right? How about we'll partition Poland a little bit and we'll chop all this up? Now, some of y'all are like, Mr. Terry, why would Poland agree to this? Well, a lot of it had to do with that feuding nobility thing, right? Because a lot of these Polish nobles would rather rather be nobles of Russia or nobles of Prussia or nobles of Austria because with it comes more title, more land, more holdings, and more power, right? Because those areas were much stronger than Poland at the time, right? So a lot of Poland's monarchy or like former monarchists, non-monarchists now and their nobles are going to actually agree to this. And by the 1900s, y'all, by the 1900s, as you can see, Poland no longer exists, right? Because they chopped it up not once, not twice, but three different times, right? In three different partitionings by literally the 1900s gone, right? Like, so, like, literally, it's just gone. Poland is erased off the map, which is absolutely bananas. But that right there is an example of how, literally, diplomacy avoided war. You see what I'm talking about, right? Because those guys came to agreements, right? Catherine, Frederick, and Joseph were all like, I'll take this part, you take this part, I'll take this part. It's like agreeing on what slice of pizza you're gonna get, right? I'm a big fan of the slice of pizza with the pizza with the bubble in it, you know what I'm talking about? Very, very good stuff. Now, going into it, though, but what if diplomacy is not an option? What if you don't have really, really strong leaders like a Catherine the Great or a Joseph the Second? or a Frederick the Great, if you don't have those people, right? The only other option is usually going to be war, right? So how do you maintain the balance of power in Europe and make sure that a France doesn't get too strong or that a Prussia doesn't get too strong or that an Austria doesn't get too strong or a Russia doesn't get too strong? How do you make sure that they all don't get too, too powerful to the point that where they can take over the rest of Europe, right? Which... Of course, we're going to learn later on when Napoleon shows up that the balance gets really, really jacked up there as well. But how do you maintain it through war, right? Well, let's look at two different cases of this, okay? So there are two different sets of wars that you could argue the balance of power was really, really held up using war. And one of them was against people that you would consider outsiders from Europe or non-Europeans. And then the other one is going to be a consideration of insiders or people that how European to European kept that balance of power going. So the outsiders situation that we're going to talk about first mainly has to do with this place, right? In 1683, you're going to see the Ottoman Empire reach some of the height of its expansion, right? Now, the Ottoman Empire, what that is, is, is a, uh, blah, 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 excuse me, they are a Turkish-based empire, right? Based completely out of what it was known as Constantinople and is now referred to as Istanbul, right? The Ottoman Empire was a very, very present power throughout much of the Middle Ages and was an extremely strong empire at the time, right? But the issue is, is that as of the 1600s, their power is beginning to dwindle because they are not keeping up with technology logical advancements, and they are also not keeping up with economics, much like the other European powers are, right? Now, this somewhat, you could argue, eastern-slash-western empire of the Ottomans, right, is still a threat, though, and they don't like the fact, 
and that they have to compete with their power, and also the Russians can't stand them, and they want to take as much land from them as they can get. Well, the Ottoman Empire was looking to try and increase its influence into Eastern Europe and to take over other parts of Europe, right? Because at the time, they already controlled places like Greece and Albania and Macedonia and Kosovo and Serbia and Bosnia and areas of Croatia at the time. So they wanted to increase their influence and expand even further, right? Well, they actually had decided to go after one particularly large group, right? That being the Austrians, right? They decided to start a small war with the Austrians because they wanted to expand into the Austrian ha austro Habsburg Empire, and the Habsburg family is going to be like, nope, and stop them completely, right? Because what's going to happen is the Austrians, the Holy Roman Empire, and the Polish decide to meet them at this place called the Battle of Vienna, right? And of course, it happened right outside of Vienna, right? The capital city of Austria, right? And if you look really, really closely right here, Vienna, a beautiful city right here on the Danube, right? Is actually right at the edge of the Ottoman extent, right? So going into it, though, what's going to end up occurring, though, is that the Austrian, the, Hung the Austrians, the Holy Roman Empire, and the Poles all come together and unite to stop the advancement of the Ottoman Empire. And is this a turning point? Yes, this is a major turning point in European history because it's going to kind of signal the beginning of the end of the Austria or the uh, excuse me of the Ottoman Empire right Ottoman like Empire will ne or the Ottoman influence in Europe will never increase from this point it will actually only slowly go down right so now the other big thing about it as well is it's a moment that you can see when other powers are uniting against a common enemy now some people of course that are professors that might be watching this right now I know I hear you dr. so-and-so all right I hear you in the back oh but mr. Terry the Holy Roman Roman Empire and the Holy Roman Emperor ship was been owned by the Austrian Habsburgs for hundreds of years and the Poles have been partitioned by them leading up to this point. Why, this seems like it's just Austria versus the Ottomans. You're not wrong, but the Poles hadn't been partitioned yet because that didn't start until 1772. And the other thing about it, though, in general, is it doesn't really matter. It just has a unification of Europeans against the common enemy. Now, but really quickly, though, but what if your common enemy is inside of Europe, right? What if your common enemy are Europeans, right? So the big situation where we see this is actually when we talk about our next class, the absolutist, the guy, the wig wearing, quaffed, like why are all my pictures so pixelated? Tights wearing, heels wearing, emperor, or like pretty much emperor and king known as Louis XIV. The guy that your state is named after, that Louisiana is named after, is going to be the biggest example of how people came together to stop the advancement of an insider of Europeans, all right? So now, his constant wars are gonna be a great example of how the power balance in Europe was almost tipped too far in one direction. Louis XIV was at war for 33 years of his over 50 year reign, right? He was constantly at war because he was always trying to expand France's influence, right? He had the Dutch war trying to expand his influence into the Spanish Netherlands. He had the Nine Years War trying to expand and his influence into the Holy Roman Empire. And then he had another very famous one known as the War of Spanish Secession. And as you can see, my guy was literally fighting all over the place just trying to grow the borders of France, right? To try and grow their borders, grow their influence, and grow their prestige. Now, the one that you can obviously tell that I'm going to talk about is the War of Spanish Secession, right? Because that, to me, is the most important one. Because there was an issue that popped up in Spain that led to Louis almost getting too powerful. So the rest of Europe's going to get together, form this thing known as the second grand alliance and they're gonna stop him right so what ends up going down though is mostly due to the fact that what happened is this guy died on the spanish throne now for those of you who remember this dude this guy was from your summer assignment right that is carlos the second or charles the second of spain who was the inbred product of the spanish habsburg family right this is the guy that could not walk until he was four he didn't talk until he was eight he drooled constantly he has a classic case of habsburg jaw and what ended up happening is he died with no heirs to the throne obviously because he's walking around going so like now because literally the dude could barely communicate drool it just there's a whole thing now he ends up dying with no heirs to the throne right and since he dies what ends up happening is we have ourselves a secession crisis right the Habsburg family is now dead in Spain okay so what ends up happening though is this guy takes the throne right that dude's name is Philip the fifth right this dude takes the throne and guess who he is he is Louis the 14th's grandson, right? So this right here is what everyone in Europe was fearing at the time, right? A conglomeration of France and Spain together, which terrified the living daylights out of the rest of Europe, because if you took France and all their colonial holdings and Spain and all their colonial holdings and took their armies and mushed them together, 
That's a terrifying power that gives way too much power to Louis XIV, who's the most powerful monarch in Europe at the time in the first place, and it also doubles his effectiveness, right? And it would end up leading to basically just him using Philip as a puppet and controlling the economics and the power structure within all of Europe. So what ends up happening is we had a power imbalance, right? Because when Louis XIV and Philip V came together, they ended up weighing this whole thing down. So how do you stop them? Well, all of Europe decided to come together, right? England, the Netherlands, the Austrian Habsburgs, and the Holy Roman Empire united together to form this thing known as the Second Grand Alliance, right? And at the Second Grand Alliance, okay, they are end up actually going to go into war with France to try and be, for, cause a split between these two places, and it technically resulted in a draw. A lot of death for a draw, right? Now, but the Treaty of Utrecht, though, kept the power of France and Spain separate, right? This treaty, which is what the Grand Alliance truly wanted, was just a line drawn in the sand saying, France, you will be over here, Spain, you will be over here, right? Creating two separate spheres, right? Now, the next thing we need to understand, though, is these professional militaries. But we're going to finish up talking about that stuff in class, because I told you this would be about 16 minutes, and I got excited. Sorry about that. Talk to y'all soon. Y'all have a good one.